Our third and final case, Corey versus Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, number 12-2239. Uh, Mr. Holroyd, we'll be glad to hear from you, sir. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Fred Holroyd, and I represent uh, Michael Corey uh, in this uh, appeal and uh, cross-petition for enforcement. Uh, the, uh, uh, the background of this case basically is that uh, Ms. Walker made a effort to uh, 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 rent a house from Mr. Corey. Uh, she advised him uh, in her first face-to-face -face, uh, meeting that she had a uh, severe autistic brother, uh, Mr. Corey being uh, not particularly overly educated in that uh, particular field. Uh, uh, this raised a question in his mind as to what uh, uh, severe autism meant. So he, um, he said, I'd like to meet your brother. Uh, part of his program uh, in renting houses, and he has 15 or 18 at, at this time, part of his uh, program in renting houses was to meet uh, and get an application from all of the adults that lived in his house. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Ms. Walker's uh, brother, Gregory, uh, was an adult and, of course, was living in the house, uh, was to live in the house. Uh, he, had, he gave her an application and asked her to fill it out. Uh, she uh, uh, had some, he, he asked her what, uh, 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 whether or not her brother was, uh, 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 could, whether she could get a doctor's statement uh, stating whether or not her brother uh, would be a danger to the, uh, uh, to the community. He, his house was next door to some small children. Did he ask whether or did he, did he demand a statement? I don't think he ever got to the demand stage. Uh, uh, I, I, what he said was... Uh, I, I would like to have a doctor's statement uh, to this effect, but he also said, if I meet your brother or if I get uh, the uh, doctor's statement, uh, we won't have any problems. Uh, I, I think probably, and not being naive as uh, Ms. Walker was, she probably would construe that as a demand that she wanted a, a doctor's statement. Yes. Well, while we're on the subject of naivete and, and lack of sophistication or education, I think you mentioned that you at least suggested that your client may not have been as sophisticated as might be uh, ideal in these circumstances. That's not a defense, is it? Well, the, the statute provides that a, an individual does not have an obligation to rent to someone who would, who would damage their property. And somewhere along the line, if you have a, a suspicion or something that would indicate that there is a potential of damaging your property, uh, in order to meet that standard, logic would tell you that you would be entitled, you should be entitled to do at least a preliminary investigation to make a determination as to whether that person would be damaging to your property. And, and that's what Mr. Corey was attempting to do at that time. The, um, <clears throat> of course, the problem with that is that, that the basis for him making any further inquiry was simply based upon this individual's disability and his limited knowledge of saying, well, I kind of know someone like this or uh, who flails and may be disrupted. And that, from the secretary's perspective, because what limits us is we could feel totally different about how this goes, but we're limited to our standard of review here in terms of what the secretary did under the Administrative Procedures Act. So when we're dealing with it from a perspective that someone just based on their own belief, whether it's sophisticated or not, of a person's disability would create a different circumstance there. That's 
from my understanding, is where the secretary went with this. And the question is whether there's evidence to support that. Well, uh, there's, there's, there's more factors than that. I, I think if the uh, Newtown, Connecticut uh, incident where the fellow that uh, borrowed his uh, uh, mother's uh, weapons and shot up the school, uh, who was uh, severe autistic, if that had, cap, uh, had occurred immediately before this, I think that we would not uh, have an argument here that he would not have a suspicion that there was a basis for uh, uh, inquiring into whether or not there would be violence here. I'm trying to follow that example to understand the mere fact of knowing someone is disabled can lead you to have some caution in light of Newtown or even under these facts. What, what, tell me what you're talking about because I'm not understanding that analogy. Be, it, what we're talking about is a disability and the act says you cannot discriminate against someone simply because they have a disability. I We're not talking about the fact that he actually saw this individual, he had any knowledge about his propensity, he just had one fact, he has autism. That's, that's correct. And as Brian. a result of that, he then lays out these conditions that I don't think anybody else gets uh, in terms of the $1 million bond and, and, and that sort of, so I'm trying to connect, help me with that and understand where you're going with that. Well. He was trying to determine whether this condition, this handicap, I readily acknowledge is a handicap. He was trying to determine whether this handicap constitute, uh, was, was a condition that would result in damage to his property. Now, if she had said he is autistic, I, I would totally agree with you, sir, that he would, he would have no basis for uh, uh, making an additional a suggestion, a requirement uh, that she get uh, a, a million dollar uh, 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 insurance policy or a doctor's statement. I would totally agree with that. But if, when if she, she puts had just the, said he's autistic, what, so what did she say additional? She said he is severe autistic. Now, I asked her, I asked Ms. Walker, what do you think of uh, severe autism is? She says, I don't, I don't know. I said, can you define it? And she said, no. So she had lived with this fella, and she couldn't define it. When I got into this case, I didn't know what the heck it was, uh, and I couldn't define it. I'm not sure I could today. And the law allows a prospective landlord to conduct appropriate investigation of the suitability of a prospective tenant. Correct? Yes, sir. This includes, among other things, checking with the prior landlord. Yes, sir. Correct? Yes, sir. Did your client do that? Um, he did not, and I will... He, will didn't, he didn't even inquire, did he, into the prior living arrangement? For this simple... Beyond what... You're, you're, you're correct, Your Honor, for this simple reason. So she why, was, why, why, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. She was obligated, he handed her a, uh, an application. He says, fill this out. Now, he test. she did not fill the application out. She never applied for the job. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, she never applied for the, uh, for the house. Uh, she, uh, uh, did not fill out the application. Now, he testified, and, there went, and everybody that testified in the, the situation, including her then current uh, landlord, said that he would not lease a house to anyone who would not, had not filled out an application. Now, she put this landlord on the witness stand, and I asked him that question, and that's what he said. Now, the application, according to Mr. Corey, what he did was he checked uh, the, the person's employment, he checked their income, uh, he checked their uh, credit rating, he checked their criminal uh, rating. Now his checking of, the, of her credit uh, indicated uh, he did not get to check it because she hadn't filled out the application. If he had checked, as evidence subsequently uh, produced. If she had checked his application, she would ha he would have determined that uh, 
Uh, she had uh, bad credit. That she uh, had I, I see you're going to you're going to the uh, any other reason kind of defense, but you're no, no. Point, I, I was going I, to. I think your I think your point is, or at least from my perspective, if instead of going into all of this about a one million dollar insurance policy and a bond and a doctor's note, if when she advised him of her brother's disability, he had simply delivered the application to her, let her make all of these disclosures, then I suspect we wouldn't be here today. I totally, I totally agree with and you, Judge. And that's what the law contemplates will be the process. Person expresses an interest in renting a property. The landlord provides an application in writing. The form is filled out. The information is given to the landlord, and the landlord is free to conduct all of those investigations that you just listed. Credit, criminal background, insurance background, including prior landlords. He didn't do that. I, I understand that, and Judge, if you look back on this case from, from this perspective, certainly that would have what I would have advised him to do. But he was spooked, if you will, by the characterization of severe and autism. And that's what the law is designed to prohibit, this spooking, merely by the use of a term connoting a disability. Well, I, that's I, what I, the law is aimed at. I understand that, but the reality of the matter is, Judge, that he... He was concerned as to whether or not he would have uh, subjected his property or his neighbors to damage, and he wanted to find out <clears throat> from her doctor. And Ms. Walker said it would have been a very easy thing, and she could have gotten this doctor's statement in a few days. But she decided not to do it. Because he spooked her. Well... I don't know whether she set him up or not, Judge. She could well have done that. There's no evidence that I know you, of that you, she did. You suggested but she set him up? I said, I, there's, I said there's you, no you evidence she, that she, she did. you really wanted to go through all of this? Pardon me? Are you suggesting to the court that... No, sir. Okay, I didn't think so. No, sir. No, sir. I was negativing that situation. But the fact of the matter is that he gave her the application... Had she completed the application, had he uh, gone through his normal process of reviewing the application, making a determination as to whether or not she qualified for the rent, she did not have sufficient income to do this. She did not, uh, she could not pass the criminal test and she could not pass the uh, credit test. Well, but, but none of that excuses what happened prior to that process with respect to the claims in this case, if your client violated the law before any of this occurred and before this application might have been rejected, as you assume, it still doesn't excuse the statements that were made pre-application. And those were, I mean, that's predominantly what uh, the secretary was concerned about. In this I, I, I appreciate that, Your Honor, but the secretary also... Uh, refer to the McDonnell Douglas standards, which is a Supreme Court case in, in the labor uh, in the labor field that sets the standards for a uh, uh, for these these type cases, and that is first that the uh, individual is uh, uh, a uh, protected person, <coughs> which he was, uh, whether or not they uh, filed an application, which she did not. Uh, the, the third one, whether or not uh, she was uh, uh, denied and whether or not there was a basis for doing that. Uh, so McDonnell Douglas, in this case, uh, was not followed. Uh, I think you look at um, the McDonnell Douglas... Uh, I thought I had the citation on that, but I don't. Uh. Well, 
even with McDonnell Douglas, do you get there if the secretary has found there is direct evidence? McDonnell Douglas kicks in when you're dealing with indirect evidence, which the secretary alternatively found existed here. Then you get to show well, it was a prima facie case, then you get to shift the burden, then you go, et cetera. Yes, sir. But when there is direct evidence, as the secretary has found here, you don't do this burden shift on the McDonnell Douglas. Uh, uh, but but still, Your Honor, she has the, he ha, under any standard, at least in my view of the law, under any standard, you have to be in a position where you uh, you qualify for the for the rental. Somebody came in and said, "Well, I'm not employed. I don't have any income. I don't work. I don't do anything. But I want to rent the house." And that is correct. But the problem here. It deals with the particular sections in the, in, in the regulations, and this conduct occurred pre-application. Yes, sir. And these so these alleged discriminatory statements were made then. That's the problem. Is is and and that's and and part of the as I indicated earlier, the part of the, the challenge that you have is the standard of review we are limited to, and that is we then look at what the secretary has done. And we've got a very limited window of review, and that is whether it is supported by evidence. Uh, I understand. And even if we disagree, and we could agree with every word you're saying, but nonetheless, if that's supported by evidence, we're stuck with it. I understand that, Your Honor, but there's no question that the Secretary stating the law was, was accurate. She, Certainly, uh, the Secretary of State certainly stated the law, but she changed the facts of the case. Uh, an, an example is that she said that he made a condition that uh, she uh, agree to uh, uh, pay uh, for any damages that occurred, and that was one of the conditions that she held to be illegal. But as the administrative law judge found, uh, that was a condition that was held, that was standard in the applications that he required of everybody. I asked uh, Ms. Walker uh, in her testimony if uh, she thought it was reasonable that a person be required to pay for the damages that they occurred, and she said that's, she said she thought that was reasonable. Yet the secretary used that as one of the basis for denying are for a ruling that he discriminated against her. Well, wasn't the secretary looking at the uh, totality of the circumstances of that early interaction between them? Of course, any tenant has to pay for damage. That's why we have security deposits. I don't, you, you interpret the record to, to mean that the secretary singled out Without regard to the context, his statement to her that she was going to have to pay for damage occasioned by uh, the residency of her son, of her brother in the property? That's not well, how that's, I read it. That's what, that's what she said. What, what are you relying on in the record? Do you have a, yeah, sure. I a think record I can citation? Give, I think I can give you that record. Uh, Well, I thought I could, but I don't. Well, your client said, I mean, he, he wrote down, right? Tenant to sign paper to be responsible for any damages caused by her brother. Yes, sir. That was all a part of the discussion about the brother, the autism, the danger. It wasn't just paying for damage caused by the tenant. It was damages caused by her brother. But that was a standard... That was a standard requirement in, in his contract with everybody. That's exactly the point. So if he'd just given her the application and proceeded with a legal investigation, whatever lease document they eventually would have executed would have contained exactly that. So the question is, why was it necessary to even discuss that in advance of the completion of the application? Well, I think that's I, what the secretary's pointing. Yeah, to. I, I don't have I don't have an explanation as to why that was that was put in there, Your Honor. I don't I can't 
I can't give you that explanation, but uh, I, I, can, I, I can tell you that it's a standard thing, and the administrative law judge found it that was in everybody's contract. Uh, that's undisputed. So it, it wasn't any anything unusual, but the, still. But the, but the secretary, as Judge Wynn suggested to you, the secretary, reading the secretary's decision <coughs> here, had a basis for inferring that this interaction, this initial interaction, was in the nature of an interorum interaction to use your word, to spook her off. And he rented the place to a family that actually had less income than she did, according to well, one interpretation of the record. Uh, I understand he made this statement about the car, and she had expenses for car, having a car. I don't know if that's true. Sometimes people who have a, have a car spend less money on transportation well, people uh, who have to take public transportation or taxi cab. But on, in, in addition to that, Your Honor, there was uh, a $300 to $350 uh, income that she claimed that she made off of the books. Uh, a lot of people do in times of I understand of that. But part of his typical policy, and this was undisputed in the record, part of his typical policy was that he uh, uh, checked everybody's... Uh, uh, income looked at their 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 uh, uh, tax uh, ticket to make sure that they uh, were honest in telling him what the income was, and that he kept uh, 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 denied people in uh, rental if they didn't produce a, this, that particular amount of income. And that would have been perfectly proper in this case if he had permitted the application process to follow the ordinary course. One would, one would presume. Yes, sir. Well, it, it's for those reasons, Your Honor, that we uh, respectfully submit that uh, uh, the uh, order should not be enforced. Thank, Thank you, you very gentlemen. much. Thank uh, you, gentlemen. Mr. Holdroyd. Um, we'll hear from the secretary. Uh, may it please the court, uh, Christopher Wang, on behalf of the secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. It would be remiss if I didn't open my remarks with a response to opposing counsel's invocation of Sandy Hook, which Judge Wynn had a question about. It's my position that this statement is just additional evidence that uh, Mr. Corey doesn't get it. There have been plenty of crimes of gun violence that have been committed by individuals without disabilities, yet we don't assume that individuals with certain physical characteristics in common with those shooters are necessarily dangerous. Likewise, the Fair Housing Act prohibits assuming that individuals with autism are dangerous merely because Adam Lanza was dangerous. After learning from potential tenant Dolores Walker that she would be living with her brother Gregory, who is diagnosed with autism and mental retardation, Michael Corey did not subject Walker to only neutral and generally applicable requirements, such as providing references and answering the counsel said the problem is, is that when she said severe autism, that, that that in and of itself was enough to trigger at least some type of response uh, from the landlord. Uh, to have autism is one thing, but severe autism would, would seem to have greater implications. How do you respond? I, I disagree, Your Honor. There's nothing in the statute or regulations that indicate that uh, a, a potential tenant indicating that a, a disability is uh, severe as opposed to just a, a general normal a normal course of disability in any way affects the, the obligation of the landlord to apply only neutral and generally applicable requirements. So in this instance, I assume that if, um, if Ms. Walker had not revealed this, uh, and then would there be any opportunity for him to know this? I'm trying to understand. She revealed it to him for some reason. Why? She says, she indicated in the record that she's very open with uh, potential landlords, that, her, that she is caring for her brother, who is a grown man and it ha it has been diagnosed with autism and, and mental retardation. I think it's just a matter of her wanting to be fully upfront in disclosing 
the, the condition See, of her brother. That almost seems discriminatory in and of itself, that if someone is disabled, why do you need to tell someone that? I don't uh, think the except law... Except when she adds the adjective severe to it, it's almost as if to alert him, alert the landlord, uh, that you are, I have someone who has severe autism. <clears throat> Well, the first point, Your Honor, that I'd make is that um, Ms. Walker's not a doctor, so whatever she says about uh, her brother's condition being uh, severe well, or not severe. I'm trying to deal severe. with from Mr. Corey's perspective, and he's, of course, you have the violations here. He's been uh, found uh, to have violated by the secretary. But what is his, uh, how does educate him as, how does he respond to that? You're a landlord, you have property. You're about to rent it to a lady, and she says, I have a 48-year-old brother who has severe autism. And you say, what? You okay, say, and walk away. You say, I would like to, to meet him. That's one possible uh, resolution to Which the issue. Which was not done here. There's a factual dispute as to whether uh, Mr. Corey asked to meet Gregory. Uh, Ms. Walker claims that he never asked to meet Gregory in that if he had asked, she would have agreed. And indeed, the record, she testified that she brought Gregory to, to, to several subsequent uh, in-person tours. Would it be discriminatory to then investigate? Once you know a person has autism, do, is it discriminatory to then conduct something special and do something different than you do with anybody else out there? It is, Your Honor, because it naturally assumes so that someone... So how is he going to say, I want to meet you? For what? To see what autism is about or to discriminate against him? To meet him, to see whether what his condition is, li is like. I, I think there were several people who testified that Gregory was a very gentle soul. And had he met Gregory in person, he would have seen that. That's part of the But I the thought you told me it was it was be discriminatory for him to investigate. I would say, well, the point that I'm trying to make is that it's not discriminatory if you apply neutral and generally applicable requirements that you apply to all potential tenants. Say if Mr. Corey had a requirement, I think he claimed this in below and in the briefs, that he has a requirement that he meets all potential tenants before he leases any property to them. And if he had done that, then, he, then that would be permissible. That would not be a violation of the Fair Housing Act, and I suspect we wouldn't be here right now. What he did wrong was after, assuming, assuming, for the mat, assuming his account of the story is correct and that he did ask to meet Gregory, is when he went beyond the request to meet and imposed these three discriminatory conditions that he related directly to Gregory's disabilities and imposed only on individuals with disabilities. That's where the violation of the Fair Housing Act came. Well, but the landlord says, at least with respect to one of these, that the assumption of responsibility for damages applied across the board. So how does the secretary deal with that? Well, there's, there's nothing in the record that indicates exactly what the, uh, the assumption of responsibility states. Uh, one would have to wonder what, uh, but that, what, what I is... Mean, that's fairly, that, I think, in yeah. my experience, uh, fairly typical of, of leases that a, 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 a tenant assumes responsibility. I mean, that's fairly obvious. You damage something, you're going to pay for it. Point taken, Judge Diaz. I, I would say one would have to wonder if it didn't add anything to the lease, why would Mr. Corey ask Ms. Walker to sign it? I also add that in, in considering the totality of the circumstances, that in addition to this request for liability insurance and the request for a doctor's note, the assumption of responsibility was just sort of an additional insult to, uh, to Ms. Walker, uh, basically telling her that she would, have to, uh, she would have to satisfy all these conditions to rent the property just because Mr. Corey assumed that her brother was dangerous because of his disabilities. Well, the statute doesn't protect against insult, at least not generic insult, that protects against discrimination. That's correct, Your Honor. That, I, I think that, that goes toward her emotional distress she suffered, but ind indeed you, you are correct that, that as long as the, the conduct here has to be discriminatory or indicate a, a preference or limitation against individuals with disabilities, which I, I'm, I think that's very clear that the conduct in this case did. This, the, this is somewhat outside the record, but I'm, I'm frankly very curious. Uh, does the secretary operate a form of community mediation? Um, I, one of the things that strikes me about this case is that it probably could have been resolved in a very healing, uh, educative way under the right circumstances, in the right community. 
because frankly, I suspect this kind of thing happens far more often than we would like to think. And I would like to think that not every time it happens, it turns into a federal case. Not that there's anything wrong with a federal case. But I'm just curious to know whether the Secretary, and I know the Civil Rights Division operates all kinds of community mediation and healing and uh, kinds of processes that help people rise above their ignorance. And I say that with all respect, because people are ignorant about disability and differences. And there's a difference between ignorance and intolerance. And sometimes, if we can address ignorance without specifically intending to, we end up addressing intolerance or suspicion or stereotyping. So sorry for the long speech, but does the department, either HUD or, or uh, 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 Civil Rights Division, take a, an approach that achieves those kinds of goals as well in these cases? Well, I, I agree completely with your sentiments, Judge Davis. I, I don't know for certain if, if HUD uh, operates such a, a mediation program. I do know that as part of the injunctive relief, uh, Mr. Coy was ordered to take some federal uh, Fair Housing Act training courses, so mm -hmm. I suspect that it might be part of that program that they might have. Yeah. Programs to and it could have happened at the front end rather than that, I think that would have been preferable for all parties involved if, if yeah. that had happened at the front end. I suspect, uh, obviously, Mr. Corey, from everything we see in the record, is a respectable businessman who is providing services and housing to people in the Charleston area. But I, I suspect, I suspect that he felt a little insulted himself by the charges placed against him. Just a suspicion on my part. I suspect that as well, Your Honor. Yeah. And so things perhaps break down when they take an adversarial posture. And that's, that's too bad. But what the law is the law. And sometimes education is more painful than it perhaps <laughs> needs to be. I'd like to turn now to, uh, to Mr. Corey, the well, opposing counsel. Do, I, I think you know, dovetailing where Judge Davis has gone with that, and because I think um, you know, the practical effect of what we're doing here and what we're limited here really is driven by our standard of review here. So this court is fairly limited in terms of what it can do, as powerful as we can be on some things. When we're following the, the, the review of a secretary's decision, we can only, we, we've got to look at it in, in, you know, in, in, a, in a light that does not give us a de novo look at this thing here. But, you know, if, 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 if you go and you determine such a thing as what Judge Davis has indicated exists, it doesn't mean or preclude you can't do that now uh, before this court issues something that, you know, it seems like if, if, if the parties here would get together and work this thing out, you could avoid what we're dealing with right now and perhaps even avoid whatever law might flow from here. If there's an interest in that sort of thing, it just seems like all parties would be interested in that happening. Uh, and well, there may be a way to resolve it, and I, I'm sure you haven't precluded that. Uh, but I'm just saying, if that exists before, I don't see why it can't exist now, uh, given what we're dealing with here. Well, this is not the, this is not the it's, it's an important case in so many respects, but I mean, it's something that can be worked out between parties. Well, it would benefit all the parties except the lawyers, Your Honor. But I, I would say that things that are good for lawyers are not necessarily good for society in general. So well, I, I agree with that. I agree that. It never comes it, down yeah. that you fail to settle a case because it doesn't benefit the lawyers. That's a, that's a sad statement on our profession if it ever comes down there. I agree, Your Honor. <laughs> I'd now like to turn briefly to uh, the financial qualifications argument that uh, opposing counsel made. He did spend uh, quite a deal of, of time on it. I think uh, Judge Diaz correctly identified the error in this line of argument, which is that this is not a refusal to rent case. This is a imposition of discriminatory conditions. The conditions that are alleged to be discriminatory, Corey imposed those before he received an application, before he had any idea of how much money that uh, Ms. Walker made. Uh, because. He, I, there, as well, there's no, there's no uh, 
defense in subsection C or subsection F to financial qualifications. Her ability to pay uh, clearly could not have been a, a motivating factor. Uh, this is confirmed, I think uh, Judge Davis brought this point up, by Corey's subsequent rental of the subject property to an individual without disabilities who, uh, by all accounts, did not satisfy Mr. Corey's claimed monthly income requirement. Uh, Corey also can't invoke uh, Section 3604F9's direct threat defense to liability. Uh, he improperly based this defense upon blanket stereotypes of children he, with autism he claimed to have witnessed running around and, quote unquote, flailing their arms and hollering and screaming in outrage rather than any particularized concerns about Gregory, who's a 48 year old man he never met. Uh, we find this. Uh, comparison of children uh, with a grown man not only to be inapplicable but uh, particularly insulting. To the extent that Corey was framing his statements as an attempt to obtain evidence to invoke uh, subsection F9, he runs afoul of HUD's uh, Fair Housing Act regulations which prohibit a landlord from inquiring about the nature and se or severity of a handicap of a person who intends to in reside in a dwelling after it is rented. Uh, the request for a doctor's note was clearly an inquiry into the nature and severity of Gregory's disabilities. The request that she purchase liability insurance went one step further and was an assumption that Gregory's disabilities were severe and rendered him dangerous. Uh, I'd now like to turn uh, briefly, unless the panel has any additional questions about the liability issues, to the issues of uh, relief in this case. Does he challenge that? He doesn't, uh, but we are filing a cross application for enforcement, so we'd like to be uh, complete un unless the, the judge, the, the panel would prefer me not to talk about uh, damages. I, I think uh, we understand your submission, unless the colleagues have any questions. We understand your position. Okay. Um, at, at this point, I'd like to, to answer any uh, questions, that, additional questions that the panel might have. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Wayne. Thank you. Paul Roy, you, you have some time remaining if you wish to. 